I had been contemplating when to tell my parents, when to tell family members, you know, and I've since told them just recently. I did it with such hesitation. I mean, I actually did it kind of spur of the moment. I didn't have okay. it fully mapped out. I mean, they were both in tears. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, this is going really poorly. Two lifelong friends document and share their personal stories as they seek financial independence and to retire early. One reaches fire in 2020 during a global pandemic, inspiring the other to play catch up. This is Two Sides of Fi. So when we set the annual number, the annual spend, it's not really tied to your salary in any way, right? I mean, it's because you think that's kind of how you start to think about your life as you move through your career, right? Yeah. I mean, you were VP in a biotech yep. right, uh, firm. And I have to imagine what you're bringing home as your salary now is like pretty different than what you were bringing home sure then. Sure it is. It is different. <laughs> but we get so tuned to that annual, those figures, those numbers, especially as you get, you know, higher in your career or your business is earning more money. And yeah. You know, I, you see those numbers and then you can't help but back into what if you do any of the retirement math and you yeah. look at like, well, 90,000, 100,000, 150,000. It's like, man, can I make that work? If you're used to those things, how do you get comfortable with that? Is yeah. it just the idea that, okay, well, I don't have to contribute to retirement because, you know, most if you're trying to reach fire at an early age, most of what you're earning is going to go into your retirement savings, whatever that looks like. Yeah. That's right. Um, so is it just understanding that idea or is it some, was there something else that made it more comfortable or like you're saying, it's just like, let, pick that budget that you are setting for retirement and try living on that. So maybe this is, this is a very personalized answer, but I suspect something like it could work for anybody. One of the things I fell back on is I looked at when we moved to California eight years ago, when we first moved here. It was, a, and to the Bay Area, where we don't live now, yeah. it was a stretch to pull it off. I mean, yes, I had gotten a promotion, I had gotten a raise, but that did not compare to the cost of living increase. Uh, <laughs> you know, our our yeah. mortgage doubled to become our new rent, and that was a big deal for us. And I knew that we had done fine on that when we moved to California. We weren't going into credit card debt. We were still saving, not as much as we saved later on, but we're still saving at a good rate. And so I knew we could do this. And so then I actually looked at, well, what are we spending now? You know, rewinding the clock a year ago, comparing those two and actually figuring out the stuff that we were spending more on that we cared about spending more on and the stuff that was kind of silly or one time expenses or things that just didn't matter. And we talked about it. I said, so this is how much we're spending now on you know beer and wine to keep bringing that up right is that a good amount or do we think that number should be higher right because now we live in wine country we live in central coast wine country there are 350 plus wineries within a half an hour of us and that's something we enjoy doing we enjoy going to taste wine so <clears throat> is this enough money other stuff we were like man i can't believe how much we're going out to eat yeah when i was yeah. working uh, you know all those hours we would go out to eat way more yeah. And we would sometimes go out for crazy dinners. And the good news is our thoughts started to change on that. Like, you know, going out for two and three Michelin star dinners is something that Lori in particular started to feel like, I'm not getting the value out of this that we're paying <laughs> for it. Do you think that's going to change in retirement? No. Both of us agreed like, man, if that's a once a year thing, that sounds like great for us. That's not something we're going to do. But you, but you know what? When you, when you start describing these things, I'm like, Man, that those are all things. Those dinners are all things that Laura and I have given up to live here, and yeah. those are things that I want. <laughs> I and, want. And you're right to want them. Yeah. But I don't. And all you're saying <laughs> is just develop a budget. But but I I'm want not the across like I mean to then. No, the 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 fi that I want is the one that says, if I want that. I don't have to think about how much it costs. And and I'm talking within reason here. I'm not talking like I'm going to fly in a Learjet every time I want to go down, you know, to Florida or whatever. But you, do you know what I mean? Well, let me ask you this. I do know what you mean. Does your number, your calculation, does, does it assume you have any passive income? No. Do you build that in there? No, zero. Okay. Yeah. What's the likelihood you think you will have any passive income for the first five years of your retirement. Pretty high. 
Yeah, pretty okay. high. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so keep modeling, assuming zero. We yeah, do true. the same thing. That's true. Yeah. Lori has a small tutoring business. She does some remote tutoring presently all over Zoom for a few kids every week. Yeah, and cool. guess what? That adds up. Like that's that's money. That's like more than enough for your dinners you don't want to think about. <laughs> so like just build your model. How much do they way... cost, by the way? <laughs> What's that? How much Super? do your three Michelin star dinners cost? Oh Jesus. Tell like, me. Just give me I, one example. Are you honestly asking the most I've ever spent on a meal? Yeah. You're spending seven hundred to nine hundred dollars for a couple. <laughs> Oh, this is that would be like French Laundry or the okay. in it in it the Meadowwood or places like that. Yeah, yeah, those awesome. those kinds of places. So when you set your number, what is included in that? What kinds of assets count or don't count? I mean, for me, it's all just what I call kind of liquid, uh, and that is like it's accessible. So you know, we have I don't count the kids' five twenty nine accounts in right. that. So it would be cash accounts, it would be brokerage accounts, it would be retirement accounts, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. You know, in terms of setting the number, I want the, to talk about that. The yeah. more complex part for me is figuring out which of those buckets are actually accessible and how much I should put in each one of those. It's 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 le you know conceptually I know it's and I guess maybe I didn't fully appreciate the cash bucket before you and I really talked about this in detail because yeah. I had brokerage and I had, you know, retirement accounts, but the retirement accounts are effectively locked away unless you do some funny dances until you're 59 and a half. And so you kind of clued me into this idea of, I mean, there's something called the bucket strategy, right? Where you are moving assets from between these accounts in a most optimal way. Did right. you ever... Like, how did you discover that? Was it just from working with a financial advisor? They kind of clued you in or did you do, just do the research? I think like the pure bucket strategy, like you'd see in Retirement Manifesto, just to give one example, yeah. is I discovered online. Okay. There's a lot of ways to do that. We don't have a strategy where we're living off the dividends, for example. That's one thing that has some popularity behind it. Sure, yeah. For us, it's more about you know, as things hit maturity, as we need to rebalance or take losses, like that's a way to refill the cash bucket every eight to 10 months. And that's just that money that we are living off, if you will, that we're paying ourselves with every year. And so we have the engine, which is all the equity. We have the bonds, which yes, can be uh, earning like they did last year, certainly as well, but also some smoothing of the bumpy road, right from the stocks. Um, and then we have the cash that we're using to basically meet our expenses and pay for vacations on a monthly basis. Okay. Yeah. So you, you divide the buckets up a little bit differently cause I don't effectively have bonds. I mean, I just, I consider all, everything in is in the stock market for me, basically in, you know, equities as opposed to ha owning any bonds. I don't see the value right now of owning bonds, but that's just, I mean, that's obviously a personal choice. But. Yeah, it's just a, it's a risk tolerance question. <clears throat> How much did your number change over time? We had uh, directionally set where we needed to be. Um, maybe Come five on, years. give me the straight answer. No, it's true. <laughs> I mean, I, God, you asked me like quantitatively, how much did it change? Yeah, 20%, it like it's, 50%. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe in that range, 20, 20%. Because so. mine doubled. Yeah, it did. <laughs> but that's you know, just, also, that's being misinformed. <laughs> well, no, let's, let's give you some credit. I also was literally paying somebody to help us with our strategy. Yeah. I mean, my first number was pretty darn good. In, even in the absence of figuring out, you just don't make people. mistakes. I mean, you're just no, not gonna. I, you're not gonna I admit to somebody, making I paid, mistakes. I paid somebody. Okay, to go. Work. What was the first number? The first number. Come on, oh, you got it right okay. from day well, one. Like solely, solely. That's not a good own. story. Okay. <laughs> Rewind all the way. Like you, your first number, like my first yeah. number. My first number happened two years yeah. in the past. Your first yeah. number happened ten years or more. Yeah. Like how different is today's number than that number? I was off by almost half. Okay. Yeah. That makes Doing me feel better. <laughs> all by myself. No, I mean, look, you're, you're already so much better informed when you started, when we had that first conversation, I suspect you were already better informed than I was <laughs> when I started putting pencil to paper 10 years ago. Okay. Did it jump at any one point? Did you have some kind of revelation that was like, 
oh yeah, this needs to be a lot higher. A couple th factors I would say. Number one, um, talk to financial advisors and had someone actually lay out for me with their set of assumptions, which you know I, I agreed with, based on inflation, based on historical returns, and your age and the likelihood of your lifespan, I definitely didn't think about how vital what you believe to be your possible lifespan was in that. Of course, it makes perfect sense. It's a factor, right? That's how long your money has to last. Yeah. Well, my family has the bad problem of living a long time. <laughs> and you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I have to assume the worst case that I will live a very long time. And I wasn't doing nearly a good enough job in thinking about, guess what, retirement might be 50 years. Uh. I, I, you know, because a lot of those estimates, even the 4% rule originally was based on a 30 year retirement timeline. You really think you're going to make it to 100? I said, I said 50, not 53. Um, I don't know. I, I've had so many relatives make it to their 90s. So I have you're to such an engineer, man. I said I have 50, to not will, 53. Right? <laughs> well, what am I going to do? I got to get the math right. Look, so that was part of it, right? And, so, and also, I would say maybe it, even bigger, Eric, is just really starting to model all of those costs that we conveniently ignore. Yeah, when I was we start afraid you were about retiring say, early. Yeah. Health care. No, you're thinking about health care. <laughs> I didn't think about health care premiums yeah. initially, fully honest, 10 years ago. They were not a part of what I was thinking about. Yeah, and it would have uh, been different too, probably. Well, Maybe not, but I can't yeah. remember when Obamacare started. Was that 2010 I, or something? I'm bad with years. So I understood there'd be no math. <laughs> so that that's healthcare was a big one. Yeah, I was making you know hand wavy estimates of where we might live. Right, we weren't living in California 10 years ago. So yeah, and and we were talking about you know in our earliest conversations about setting a number, we were talking about living very modestly. Yeah. And our thoughts changed on that, to your point made earlier, right? What do we really want it to look like? You know, do we want to be more towards the lean fire side? Well, well over time, we decided no. Yeah, that's the thing that I was we hoping don't. you would say, because that's the thing that changed the number for us, too. Just getting more realistic with, okay, this, in some ways, is a, I mean, it's a pretty serious decision. And, and for at least one of us, it's more permanent than the other. And so you got to, you know really be honest with yourself as to how you actually want to exist. Like, what are you actually going to spend? Are you going to take a $5,000 vacation or a $10,000 vacation? And what is, what are the differences? And I mean, to be honest, we're still kind of struggling with that. And yeah. I'm kind of glad that we're starting to have those conversations now because it could, if it has to push out the, the time horizon, now we can do that. But yeah. if you don't think those things through, you you're missing that opportunity to, to course correct. <laughs> yes. So the earlier you think those things through, I think the, the better off you are. If you rewind my own clock two years, it felt like we kept having those realizations and they were making me nervous. Lori <laughs> yeah. wasn't getting nervous. Me at too, all, man. <laughs> but I was getting so nervous. I was like, well, no, actually it it's a lower withdrawal rate is better, but we also just thought about this cost that could come later on. Like, okay, we better increase the it's number. A lot worse. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, but that is the time to have those conversations, yeah. right? You, you don't want to have buyer's remorse. Although Lori, to her credit, always would tell me, look, why you're, you're worrying an awful lot. So, <laughs> you know, so you pull the trigger and you leave work like, okay. And you decide like it was the wrong decision. Like, like nobody will hire you again. That it's done, right? You're, I mean, the you're thing, done. You're, the, you're, you're, you're persona non grata. I get that idea. And it, right. Of course not. But there's also some, I mean, you must be thinking about this, especially in a field like biotech. When you step out of, of the game, you are kind of a little rusty, you know? Sure. I mean, I'm not saying that you couldn't go back, but I'm not sure you'd go back to the same level and you're not going to have, maybe you wouldn't want to, right? Yeah, That's yeah. the challenge, right? Maybe you wouldn't want to. You I know I wouldn't now. Yeah. You might not have the same domain expertise. I mean, I'm already feeling like in a lot of ways, you know, when you age up in a profession and especially if you're like me and you're just working by yourself, like you got to yeah. work pretty hard to stay engaged in the cutting edge of that. I mean, there's, there's a natural succession that happens here. There and is. so I think to, Pretend like you can step back into the thing as you as it existed when you left it is kind of a false notion. But I agree with that. But there still is. I mean, the concept there to me that's important is just 
you can do the barista fire thing. Like you could do that at any point. I realize that is, but yeah. that is definitely not meeting my version of what financial independence is. And so I want to do everything like you to possibly prevent that from happening in the same way with that with yeah. the business. I, when I started this thing, I didn't want to go back to working for somebody else. So those things tend to drive you in a very specific way. They do. I think the other thing I would add to it is going back to our conversation about passive income. It's very interesting to go into one of your models and your Monte Carlo analysis and just change your mm. your your monthly withdrawal rate by a thousand dollars, right? Twelve thousand a year. It can have a very large impact. That's cool. Uh, yeah, that'd be a cool and, thing and to try. And it's interesting to do that because look, while I don't know what I'm going to do and if and what of these many, if any of these paths I'm kind of exploring right now will, pa you know, pan out to be something I want to do as a small business. But I've also convinced myself that, man, if it, if I did something and it made a thousand dollars a month, you know, a couple hundred dollars a week, that's great. Like yeah. that's actually big. So that's cool. I, that also gives me a lot of comfort to be totally honest with you. And, and it gives me comfort despite the fact that I'm not set up like you are, where you've invested all this effort into building a portfolio of, you know, an, an online presence and a personal business and digital <laughs> assets. So you already, you know how to do that. That's not to trivialize it in any way, but you've yeah. put 10,000 hours and, and many more into that already. But so that's why I like this. I like this idea of building skills that are meta skills that, you know, blogging is one, like writing is definitely one of them. You it know? is. And I consider I making video and taking photographs and, along with writing and some of the other sort of activities that I do yeah. to be skills that can apply broadly to many different, you know, avenues. And it's, it's something that I can use to earn money in the future. And I feel like those, those skills age in a different way. You know, we're always going to need writers. We're always going to need people yeah. to communicate things visually and, you know, verbally, and you can always go to coaching, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to, monetize your expertise. And so oh, I, yeah, yeah I, I feel that is one of the things that makes me feel more confident. So thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really think it should. I guess the withdrawal rate question has a lot to do with historically how successful whatever amount you're going to save, like what's the likelihood of that number working? It's risk tolerance at the right. end of the day. Yeah. I mean, the way I tend to guide people to think about withdrawal rate is go to your favorite tool, see FireSim or whatever you happen to use, yeah. and plug in your stuff and, and start with 4%, right? 4% is the most commonly cited withdrawal rate in the Fire community. Like, start with that. And if the percent likelihood that comes out makes you feel confident, like, then you're you're done. <laughs> but, you know, dial it back or dial it up and see what you think. Like if I don't think most people are pretty happy about a 50 percent success rate. So right, I suspect. Right. Right, well, that's no, why no, I was asking you about going to be OK. <laughs> like nine, like 90 percent is is one of those things like. I don't know how you are, but when I see 90 percent, I see, well, that's a 10 percent chance of it failing. <laughs> so yeah. like where I mean, it is a personal decision. Obviously, we can't advise, but it's interesting no. that you landed on 90% because maybe that'll, when I run these, this simulation, because it sounds like I really probably have to do that pretty soon, that maybe I'll like <laughs> to see where I, where yeah. I fall in there. And then maybe I'll start playing with some of my passive income and see, well, maybe I shouldn't, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that, but yeah, the withdrawal rate start changed for me because I had always ex accepted the four percent as just being gospel from the fire community and the podcasts I had been listening to. And then you're like, well, your, your withdrawal rate's not 4%, right? And I was like, what do you mean? Yeah, of course it is. You're like, well, you might consider 3.5%. And so then I started doing yeah. the research on that. I'm like, uh, okay, that feels better. And then, of course, the number, you know, that was another step up in the number. Like you're saying, unaccounted expenses increased your number. Well, for me, it was like withdrawal rate. That definitely was one of the things that said, I'm probably going to want a little more confidence in this number. Yeah. And withdrawal rate, is one of those things that you mentioned earlier that you could always change. Like you get into a sticky situation. Absolutely. You're probably going to park it for a little while, right? You're not going to do the same level of traveling or, you know, pandemic was the perfect example, right? Your, your withdrawal That's rate right. went down from your expected rate by half a percent, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, more. It also depends on the tool you're working with. Depending on which Monte Carlo simulation method I use, I get 90 to 98%. Oh, so quite a oh. few tools peg me at 95%. That's a big so difference. The, <laughs> it is. Well, the, the most conservative assumptions. Yeah. There, there's also some things you can do. There's some different tools that perturb average return as well as um, the in, uh, rate of inflation. What do you use for and, average return, by the way? Um, over the long, long term, yeah. I tend to use 7%. Okay. Yeah. When we're looking at a window that long, that's incredibly safe. That's over a 50 year period, you said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. But I've done lots of perturbations of uh, rate of inflation as well, cost of health care. Um, I think that's uh, newretirement.com is the one that has those perturbations built into their tool. So that can be interesting to see. Okay. At the cool. end of the day, everyone's got their comfort level and what they're willing to accept. Right. And, and that's I think that's just the best way to think about withdrawal rate. If somebody does, I've probably pointed you towards this, but if somebody does want to nerd out on the math of withdrawal rate early, uh, uh, is it early retirement now? Is that the guy's blog? Earn. Yeah. Uh, big, big earn has written this almost, I think, 40 part series on Karsten. withdrawal rate and uh, the and the uh, sequence of returns risk. Yeah, yeah. It's really good if you want to get buried in the numbers. It may make you slightly anxious. But <laughs> I think one of the things it does is references what you were just saying, Eric, this whole idea of you can change your withdrawal rate. There's a lot of different strategies. It doesn't have to be static. Yeah. Uh, and you can see the effects of those different strategies mathematically. So if that's your thing, great. Uh, the other end of the spectrum is 4% fixed forever. That's what I've read and I like. You know, that That's not personally my risk. Uh, zone, but hey, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. Yeah, I mean, it's gonna work a lot of the time. <laughs> it's the times when it, a lot of the time it's gonna work, and the times when it doesn't work, it's gonna be pretty disastrous. <laughs> I mean, these yeah, are. I these hope are that small makes you decisions. feel better. <laughs> these are small decisions we're making here. <laughs> Stepping away from your career, <laughs> right, just and minor. not having any more income. And I would be lying if I said. I didn't have nerves going yeah. up to that point if I had nerves going out <laughs> after that point. But I will tell you that nine, eight or nine months later now, I spend a heck of a lot less time thinking about that. I mean, I used to uh, supervise international teams and one of my offices in Europe, um, the people there would talk openly about their salaries with each other. Huh. And that had ramifications, obviously, right? You know, you'd end up having conversations with your employees about they know that they're, you know, towards the bottom of the range and they'd want to talk explicitly about why. Yeah. That type of thing didn't happen in that way in the U.S. because it tends to be more of a foreign concept to talk openly about compensation. It's kind of held pretty closely. Um, but, you know, some of it might be cultural. I, I wonder. I haven't come across this yet, but maybe in some 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 cultures, it's much more reasonable or normal to talk openly about your total assets, for example. There is a lot of value in being more open. And, you know, I mean, since the first episode that we recorded of, of this, you know, I was I had been contemplating when to tell my parents, when to tell family members, you know, and I've since told them just recently. And. And I did it. With, I yeah, I did it with such hesitation. I mean, I actually did it kind of spur of the moment. I didn't have okay. it fully mapped out. It just happened to be a time when it was just me uh, on this Zoom call. Everyone else was otherwise occupied, and so I just chose it as a moment to. I said, "Oh yeah," because obviously they knew you growing up. And I said, "Oh, did I tell you about that project Jay and I are working on?" And and it kind of organically evolved from there. And. I found myself uh, uh, being apologetic and okay. I don't know if it'd be curious to hear your story about you telling your parents, because I felt as though th this is exactly what I said. You guys gave everything you possibly had to put me through school. And I know for a fact they did that even when they didn't own a home or, yeah. you know, they, they weren't saving for the retirement. They gave it all to me and my sister to make school happen. And I felt as though, me coming to a point in my professional career where I was going to make a different set of decisions that I was letting them down and what they, I mean, they were both in tears <laughs> and I was like, Oh no, this is going really poorly. And they, my mother just said, you know, we couldn't be happier for you. You know, I, I mean, this is what we, this is what yeah. every parent wants for their kid to, to find success and be able to 
self-direct and find agency in their life. Right. And, and it's like to them, it was the ultimate sign of having been successful parents rather than how I was kind of building it up in my mind to be this, oh, they're going to be disappointed. You always want to make your parents happy and proud of you. They of were filled with pride about it. And, and it became instead of this barrier, because I felt like I was hiding something from them. Yeah. So instead of that, that barrier, it, I mean, I can't tell you how relieved I was. I bet they couldn't have been more supportive, but it's a very personal decision on when you choose to tell family, like, how did it work for you? I mean, have you told everybody to, like what? Yeah. So, so first that. of all, I would say my parents' reaction when I did talk to them uh, and obviously, you know, they've realized more and more over time uh, as, you know, shown more from, from this project and my writing <laughs> in particular, yeah. it's been very, very supportive. Uh, you know, really uh, just great reaction, uh, very encouraging. And they're, you know, just so great about, you know, even just reading everything I put out there and reacting to it publicly and also one on one. And it's really reassuring. And, you know, li like your parents, I mean, just really great people and couldn't be happier. I think from my perspective, though, I definitely didn't do a great job of, you know, kind of talking them through it, you know, well in advance and helping them understand the reasons why. Uh, I get super uncomfortable at that type of stuff. And <laughs> just kind of the way I've related to my parents as an adult, for sure, is to kind of keep any of the challenging stuff in and not share it. I don't know, not, huh. not not wanting to burden them is the way I've described it to Lori before, which is stupid, right? Of course they would want to know. And, yeah. and I sh but share, you know, share good stuff with them. Um, you know, keep them, you know, I don't know, informed and feeling happy and confident that I'm doing well. I don't know where that comes from. Cause Lori, like I, I watched the way she talks to her parents. It's great. Like she shares everything with them, the good and the bad and the challenging yeah. and the yeah. successes. And I'm, by my nature, and some of it might just be avoiding situations that feel confrontational to me or could turn confrontational. I, but it's also, a, in some ways, a flex. I, this is how I felt. and Yeah, it is. No, it is. It is. And I mean, because they didn't retire that. until, you yes. know, I, I mean, uh, last couple of years. Yeah, they worked, they worked a long time. And, you know, it's always, I, I felt really, that's a thing that, the welling of guilt inside of me yeah. was that a reaction to that. I do have a lot of guilt about uh, success. Yeah. Um, it's something I've always dodged. I mean, my siblings at times over the years in my career have asked me questions about like earning and, you know, bonuses and things like that. And I have always dodged them Yeah. yeah. because it feels uncomfortable to me, like bragging if I talk about what I earn um, and I've had people judge me for it, you know, whether they meant it that way or not, it felt that way. Like, oh, that must be nice. That's literally one of the most painful things for me to hear. Anytime I hear that must be nice. Like you didn't because, earn it. <laughs> uh, number one, I did earn it. But number two, I do recognize the privilege that I have. Yeah. And we've talked about that before, you know, being born into a family that, you know, had access to, you know, electricity and clean water and they yeah. put us in school and they supported us to your point in college. That is all being very fortunate. We were set up for success. And then we had to do something with it. Uh, we had to work hard and, and, you know, make good decisions and all of that. So yeah, it must be nice. It always like gets me right here it, and it shouldn't, right. You should have a barrier against that. But anyway, so for whatever that list of reasons, I mean, I do feel guilt when talking about it. I, I see my family, my extended family still working or, you know, having worked, you know, to a traditional retirement age. And it feels weird to be like, Oh yeah, I was able to do this sooner. Yeah. And, and also like I'm, any, I'm not, I'm not better because I could do that. Or it's not like I'm a success and somebody else is a failure, but I feel that way if I start talking about it. Yeah. So I try to be pretty modest about it. It was a huge step for me to start writing about it, but in many ways, like that's the only way I could do it easily. Right. Just putting my thoughts out there for, for, you know, random people to see, for my family to see, for yeah. my friends to see, and just hope they react well and hope that, when I'm given the time or I take the time to like try to articulate my thoughts that I would do a better job of that than in the moment I would do, uh, verbally. I, I mean, I suspect even just saying that though, I suspect it was better for you to do it spontaneously than preparing like what you wanted to say and all that. Cause I get wrapped around the axle around that kind of stuff. <laughs> I don't know if you do, but I don't know. 
I'm not surprised your parents reacted the way they did, though. That's really great to to hear. It was so, yeah, it was, that was pretty amazing feeling. But I still haven't told my sister. She doesn't know. <laughs> and, wow. And she, yeah. And Tell me you about know what's that. funny? She's um, at a point now where, so she's been calling me a lot and asking me questions about, you know, investing and so they okay. start, they wanted to open like a brokerage account. And I was like, is, is your, is your retirement account like fully funded? Like she's self-employed. Um, and I said, you should open a solo 401k cause that's, you can tax optimize with a solo 401k, like nothing okay. else. And, um, she, you know, she was considering contributing to po post-tax stuff before pre-tax. I'm like, yeah, but that's not how it works. And so I feel like some of this can just be the value of having the conversation is just that it's going to help it will someone who is who is interested in, in even just being smart with money because I, that's part of this whole path for me that's been especially transformative has been just refocusing and really dialing in on finances as a whole and it just yeah. makes you smarter and just a better you know, citizen in the world, being able to have control so. over all that information. And I, you know, I really, I do, I'm super appreciative that you helped me kind of just understand that all of this is within your reach. Like the questions my sister's asking me is all stuff she could find online, you know? Yeah. But what she's coming to me with is like, well, I, Charles Schwab could be this and Vanguard is over here and Fidelity and everyone's got their own thing. And it's, it is this confusing raft of information that if, so much. if you don't have any way to navigate it, you know, it's like the Monte Carlo thing. Like that, even that feels a little intimidating to me. And I've been thinking about this pretty hard for many, many months. And yeah. so it, it's, I don't know when I'm going to tell my sister, um, I haven't really decided, but it is one of those things, okay. you know, it's what do you keep hidden from people who are close to you? So much of that stuff is <laughs> built is just sort of those relationships and the way you carry yourself and the things you talk about and don't right. That's built up over that practice is built up over years and years and years. Yeah. And it's not to say you can't change it at any time, but like that activation energy to exceed, like that's, a, that's a very real thing for, for what some is, of us that what maybe mean? didn't talk openly. I mean that, like, you know, to, to change your behavior, right. To start talking about something more than you had done historically yeah. oh, okay. for whatever the reasons yeah. were. I know for me, that's a big deal. And it, it seems stupid, right? It seems crazy to not be always open and honest and, you know, just kind of with, with people <laughs> who you care about so much. Yeah. But like I said, it's got all this other baggage attached to it. And like yeah. money is its own thing, right? Money and wealth and like your status relative to someone else is like, a weird thing and look i mean a lot of business has been written about this like the effect <laughs> of social media like people posting their like epic vacations and right. other people feeling really bad like they're failing at life because they can't take that kind of vacation like this stuff is real like people do react emotionally um to these things and so it's no surprise that people feel weird yeah so i mean it's great that she asked you about it i love that and uh yeah, it's maybe it's an opportunity to to talk more on that, you know, you could send her the financial order of operations. I totally did. And, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Like, I I'm did. not surprised that you, you know, did. Yeah. That's you know, it's so useful or the index card strategy, <laughs> right? All that stuff is so good for getting started. You know what she did? <laughs> She's like, Whoa, <laughs> it was that kind of reactions, baby steps. But I, I think yeah, those, yeah, yeah. they're all good, you know, steps to take. And, and it just makes me wonder when you start learning about these things, you start learning what questions to ask. It's, it's the, it's the unknown unknowns that are the scariest. You know? yeah. I, li I like seeing your brewing accoutrement. Yes, it'd be more exciting if it was steaming right it now. Would, yeah, I was running over and putting hops in there. It's like sticking your mouth fun. under the aug under the uh, <laughs> spigot. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully the word is cooled by then, or it would be a very big surprise for your face to have boiling wort dumped in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>